Okay, so if you're just joining us, um, this is going to be a recorded presentation. I don't know when it will be able to go online, but we're planning to put it up on our YouTube page. Um, so if you lose Wi-Fi at any time or something or have to hop off, um, I can send everyone a copy of that recording. Um, and since it is going to be recorded, please know that if you have your video showing or um, if you end up speaking, that will be included in the recording. Um, so I, I'll take that as your permission to go ahead and, and post that. Um, but otherwise, if you want to be uh, excluded from that, um, you can feel free to use the chat function to pose any questions. I can read those questions at the end as well. Um, if you want to um, turn your video or mute yourself at any time, uh, that is on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. I think on most screens at least, um, there should be a button for mute and stop video. I'm going to go ahead and start um, muting everyone here except Tyson, who will be giving us our presentation today. Um, Tyson is president of the Auburn Hills Historical Society, and um, he has a wealth of knowledge and information about the history of our community um, dating back to our earliest settlement in the 19th century. So um, Tyson, are you ready? Yes, I believe I am. All right, go ahead and take it away. All right, so let's see here. I've got a screen share. Yeah, a second here. Uh, I had this. There we go. I think I'm almost ready here. All right, so let's back up here. Somehow we got uh, at the, sorry about this. My mistake. All right, sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> Anyway, I'm Tyson Brown, president of Auburn Hills Historical Society. Um, I am the Auburn Hills uh, Public Library and Auburn Hills Historical Society we are working together on a oral, oral history project uh, called Becoming Auburn Hills. And the idea of this presentation was to give those uh, people that would be giving uh, oral history um, interviews uh, background of the area for um, conversation purposes. I uh, certainly too much material to cover um, in this presentation about the entire Auburn Hills history. So what I chosen to focus on are those uh, points of interest that uh, I, in my experience, people talk about uh, in conversation, the, the local residents. So the things that I hope to cover in this, or topics I plan to cover, are uh, historic sites within Auburn Hills, uh, Aaron Webster and what his contribution was to the community, names given to the general areas of Auburn Hills, uh, the name changes that have occurred in the downtown area, the schools, businesses, and community, and why Pontiac Township chose to become the city of Auburn Hills. So starting with the general location names, uh, these are names that I've heard over the years, uh, certain areas of Auburn Hills referred to as the Canadian section, Bald Mountain area, Five Points, and then the downtown, which most that our local residents still call Auburn Heights to this day. Uh, beginning with the uh, Canadian section, it got this name because most of the streets and the park are all named after Canadian provinces. Within this area, there are no significant historic sites. However, just to the south of this area um, in Lake Angeles, there is a 1930s observatory. So if you are from this area, you may be familiar with this uh, landmark. It's no longer in operation, but it, do it does still exist to this day. Uh, moving on to the Bald Mountain area, uh, it, from what I understand, was originally called Ball Mountain, 
and prior to its excavation in the 1930s. The upper photograph shows a picture of it. I'm not really sure it was a mountain, more of just a really tall hill. And it was sort of rounded on top. And there was motorcycle races in this picture going on up and down the mountain. Uh, the lower picture shows excavation of it during the 1930s. And I assume that's why it eventually got called the Bald Mountain because they chopped the top off of it. So in the Bald Mountain area, there are four sites of interest. There is the former uh, monastery. There is the uh, former Palace of Auburn Hills. There's a former ski lodge, Silver Bell Ski Resort, and then Hawkwoods Nature Center. The um, uh, St. Basil's Novitiate was um, a training center for Catholic priests. It uh, operated during the 1960s and 70s. It was located on Giddings Road. And um, it still stood up until about 2000 when it was finally torn down. Uh, Palace of Auburn Hills, of course, was a landmark in this area up until this past summer in July, they imploded it. And unfortunately, I do not have photos of the ski lodge to show you. And Hawkwoods is simply a nature center with log cabins and nature trails to experience. So moving on to five points and why did it get this name? So in five points, there is a road called Five Points Drive. And at one time, that road was connected to University Road. And that, those two roads together were one road and it intersected at the intersection of Squirrel and Walton. So if we go back in time, this is what it looked like. And at that time, uh, University Drive and Five Points were called Mount Clemens Road. And this intersection, of course, has five directions. And at that intersection stood the street sign you see on your right. It is a five pointed star indicating the five directions you could take and the squirrel in the center indicates Squirrel Road. This street sign still exists. It's on the campus of uh, the city campus for Auburn Hills. It is in the flower garden just to the left of the community center. So if you wanted to go see it, it still is there. And in the Five Points area, there are several points of interest. There is an underground railroad house, which has moved location. Uh, there is Blue Sky Theater and Zahn Pond. Um, they may not be historically significant, but local residents still talk about them. So I wanted people to know where they were. Uh, Brace Beamer, uh, he was a um, radio a personality for the Lone Ranger, and he owned property in this area. Uh, there was a Five Points schoolhouse, so if you were a, a young child at this time, you may have gone to that school. And of course, we have Oakland University and the City of Auburn Hills uh, Municipal Campus, which was the former Weston Seaburn Estate. So the Underground Railroad House, um, it originally was located on Lapeer Road, and due to construction in that area, it was eventually moved to uh, Shimmons Road that was to save it from being torn down. It is still there on Shimmons Road and there is a historical marker out front telling about the history of this home. It was um, being on Lapeer Road, it was on the uh, Freedom Seekers path from Farmington to Pontiac, Oxford, Lapeer, uh, Port Huron. The uh, original owner of this home was Edward Johnson. He was a known abolitionist and within this home, there were unique features such as hidden doors and closets that would lead to the basement so someone could uh, escape or hide undetected within the home. We don't know for sure that it actually operated as a station on the Underground Railroad, but we certainly suspect that it was intended to do so. Uh, Blue Sky Theater, uh, during about 1949, it was constructed roughly and then operated through the 50s and 60s, probably the 70s, uh, by 1990, it had been replaced by Showcase Cinema, an indoor theater complex. And once that eventually fell into disrepair and uh, discontinued use, uh, by around 2014, um, it was replaced by automotive su driveline supplier uh, GKN. They uh, built their headquarters there. This, the location was on Updike Road between 
Pontiac Road and Walton Boulevard is where this was located. Uh, there is, of course, Zahn Pond. If you were a child in the area during the time, uh, you probably, maybe even against your parents' wishes, played in the pond. And the reason it got this name was because the Zahn family owned the land upon which the pond was. Five Point School, if you were a student in the area at the time, you may have gone to this one room schoolhouse. It uh, had two separate doors, one for boys, one for girls. And um, it was originally located on the Oakland University's campus. It uh, is about where the dorm rooms are today. And it eventually, of course, was torn down. Uh, in that same general area is a Brace Beamer's uh, homestead he had for a while here. It was on the north side of Walton Boulevard, uh, about where 7-Eleven is today. He eventually sold this property and moved on to Oxford. Then we have Wesson Seaburn's estate. Uh, he was a wealthy land developer and he owned quite a bit of land in this area from Walton Boulevard down to Featherstone. Uh, this was simply his weekend getaway. Uh, he actually had a larger and more palatial estate in the Detroit area, but uh, he had a place here uh, that was, at the time this area was quite rural. Uh, he used this as his hunting lodge and the lower picture shows his hunting lodge or weekend getaway. It was quite a large home. I think we'd all be happy to have that even today, but this is the 1920s and it kind of shows how wealthy this person was. He had many accessory structures on his property as well, uh, horse stables, dog kennel, playhouse for the children, and all of those were quite substantial structures as well. Most of those structures were repurposed uh, for the city of Auburn Hills municipal campus that operates today. Many of the buildings are still there. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, lodge that you see in the lower photograph was just torn down last month. So you, I would un be unable to see it. However, in the upper left corner, you'll see uh, Annette Burnett's home. Uh, she was acquainted with Weston Seaburn. And at the time that Mount Clemens Road was being reconfigured to become University Drive, uh, the home was in danger of being torn down. So the city of Auburn Hills rescued it, moved it to the city campus, and today operates as the uh, Auburn Hills Public Library. So if you were to enter the library and turn to the right, that would be the Annette Burnett House. You'll see the wooden staircase and other features of that home. And it's still in use today. The uh, Oakland University uh, was John and Matilda Dodge's uh, 320 acre farm. They were basically Weston Seaburn's next door neighbors at the time. At that point, uh, Squirrel Road was just a dirt road. As I said, it was uh, uh, a very much of a country setting. Uh, when John Dodge passed away, uh, Matilda remarried. Uh, Alfred Wilson and their fortunes together created Meadowbrook Hall. Eventually, Matilda donated the land and the money uh, to create Oakland University, which opened in 1959. So moving on to the downtown, which often is called Auburn Heights, uh, there are quite a few uh, unique uh, locations or items of interest in this area. I certainly could not talk about all of them tonight, but I will focus on those that I in my experience, people talk about most often. Uh, there is the FCA headquarters, um, or what is often referred to as Chrysler headquarters. Uh, that is on the corner of Featherstone and Squirrel. Uh, originally, that was farmland. And to the right on the screen, you'll see a picture of a farmhouse. This home actually stood on the corner of Featherstone and Squirrel Road. Uh, at one point, this was even, this land was owned by Weston Seaburn. Just south of this, oh, by the way, the uh, headquarters was um, constructed, construction began on uh, FCA headquarters in 1986. Um, the facility was largely complete by 91 and it reached full occupancy by 93. 
Um, moving on to the, uh, just south of that is uh, a Nike missile base that um, operated or uh, was uh, created in 1955. The base was intended to defend against nuclear attack by the Soviet Union during the Cold War. The base was decommissioned in 1963 and then Oakland Community College repurposed many of the buildings to open their campus in 1965. The lower right hand picture shows a, um, is of some of the uh, sergeants and generals uh, inspecting one of the missiles on that base. And the photo to the left was how that base was laid out. Uh, near Scroll Road was the command center and then near what was I-75 um, was where the uh, missiles would launch from. A little bit south of that were some gravel pits. It seems like an odd thing to focus on, but they were significant to the development that was going on at this time. Uh, at the point that these gravel pits existed during the 1950s and 60s, uh, I-75 and M-59 were being built. And rather than uh, transport materials a great distance. Auburn Hills happens to be plentiful in sand and gravel. So why not mine it locally? So this uh, area was used for that purpose to obtain materials to build the highway structures that were taking place at that time. Uh, by the 1970s, it was filled in and uh, on it now is Oakland Estates Mobile Home Park. So that is at the uh, south west corner of M59 and Squirrel Road is where the gravel pits were. And that was a place that uh, many children from the uh, Heights area, I've heard them talk about going to the gravel pits to play. They would uh, swim there and yes, a few got hurt and I'm sure their parents weren't happy about them being there. Uh, but um, that is why I bring that up because it is, was a feature of this area during that time and many residents remember it. Uh, the uh, Riverside Park is important because it was the site of our first industry in Auburn Hills. As you see in Riverside Park to the north and west is uh, the Clinton River, and that was seen as a source of power. Um, Aaron Webster and his wife, Sarah, came from Auburn, New York in 1821. They purchased 320 acres in the what would be the downtown area, and this included Riverside Park. And the reason he wanted that area was because of the Clinton River. He intended to build a, a sawmill so that he could cut lumber for uh, people moving in the area to build homes and businesses. So he went about uh, building a dam and a mill race. The mill race is a waterway that the water flow can be controlled because with a mill, you don't want varying water levels. You want it to be fairly consistent. So with the dam, you could direct either more water down the Clinton River or more down the mill race. Um, so he built the sawmill uh, to start um, cutting lumber. And during this time, he also donated land for a cemetery where both he and his wife are interred at this time or at, during that time. Uh, he also began to build a grist mill before his death. Uh, he and his wife died one day apart of typhoid fever. Uh, this is what Riverside Park would have looked like at that time. The uh, dark blue area is the mill race um, superimposed on top of the park. This would have been the waterway that would have operated the mills and the three green buildings you see um, are the mills themselves. There were um, a sawmill, um, which is in the center. That is what Aaron Webster built. In the lower right-hand corner is a picture of what that building looked like. Um, so he started cutting the lumber to um, provide to residents in the area, as well as he started to create a grist mill before his death. Uh, the grist mill and the sawmill were sold to Ebenezer Smith, and he continued uh, the mills for quite some time. In fact, some people still refer to this area as Smith Mills, or it was known as that for some time. Eventually, a 
uh, cider mill was built too. You can see part of it to the left side of this photograph in the lower right. And the, as, that, as uh, the mills were operating, you had employment in the area and the little village of Auburn started to grow up. Uh, this first store was built in 1823. Uh, Ebenezer as a Smith, as I said, purchased the mills in 1823. He completed the grist mill in 1824, and for anyone that doesn't know what a grist mill is, it was for grinding grain because we had farmers in the area that uh, were growing wheat and so forth. You would need to grind that into flour to bake it into products. Uh, we also gained a post office in 1825. Uh, Auburn was platted as a village, um, though of no legal standing, in 1826, and uh, Pontiac Township was then uh, established in 1827. So as you see, our downtown area actually predates Pontiac Township as an entity. Uh, as people were uh, moving into the area, as I said, uh, businesses were being created. Here are some early advertisements from that time period showing that we had a chair factory and a hotel and a blacksmithing and various other uh, businesses uh, were building up the downtown. As you have people moving in and businesses, um, people have to build homes. Here's an early home from that time period. This is the 1836 News Bomber Homestead. This was not originally in downtown. However, it was in Auburn Hills. It was up near Great Lakes Crossing near the Joslin Road exit. A woman named Kitty Davenport was responsible for saving this home from demolition because there was development taking place in that area and she did not want to see this historic structure um, destroyed. So she moved it to the downtown area uh, onto land that she owned. And for quite some time, it was rented out uh, as a barber shop. So many people still refer to this as the barber shop. Uh, when Kitty Davenport passed away. The city of Auburn Hills bought her property and it is now serves as what's called the den. It is basically a, a study hall or a, like a living room that you could go to uh, to relax, read a book, uh, work on your computer. Uh, the intent was for school students that wanted to study, get away from noisy siblings. They could come here and have a quiet place to do their work. Uh, as we have residents moving into the area, of course, we have schools being created. Our first school in 1824 was in the back of a wheelwright shop uh, near the Clinton River and Riverside Park. Uh, the Auburn, Auburn Academy was established in 1831. And this is a picture of it in the lower right-hand corner of the Auburn Academy. It was on the corner of Primary Road and Juniper Street. Outside on the in the bell tower of that academy was the bell that is pictured and that bell still stands today outside of a church that is now on the same property. So if you were to go to the corner of primary and juniper um, in front of that church still sets this bell with a plaque telling about the Auburn Academy that this bell had come from. On the left is stone school. Um, if people mention stone school, this is what it is. Uh, technically, it was in Troy, but it was right at the corner of Adams and South Boulevard. So students from even this area may have attended that school, and that structure still exists yet to this day. It is a local landmark. So that's why I bring it up, because it was at least uh, used in this area. Uh, as people come to the area, they bring their religion with them. Uh, listed are the first or the earliest five churches that we know about. Uh, there may have been others, but these are the ones we have record of. The second one down on the list, the Free Methodist Church of 1874, is the church that's pictured in the uh, below the list there. Uh, that church still exists to this day in downtown Auburn Hills, and it's pretty remarkable that it still operates as a church 145 years later. Not many structures uh, keep their same uh, usefulness that long but you could still attend a service there to this day. Uh, by the 1880s, uh, Grand Trunk Railroad ran a line through Auburn and we had a 
depot established at that point. So we had more commerce coming in and out. So Auburn could continue to grow. However, the village ended up being renamed Amy. And the reason for that is because there had already been an Auburn established north of Saginaw. And so the post office said, we cannot have two Auburns uh, in Michigan, basically, because it would be difficult to get mail directed the right way. So they renamed the town Amy, though that name was not well liked and it did not last terribly long. The uh, depot was located on the corner of Primary Road and Gray Road. And yet to this day, at that intersection, we have a historical marker telling about the depot. So if you were on the Clinton River Rail Trail, which was the rail line that ran through Auburn Hills, uh, there is a historical marker along that rail trail that tells about the depot. And it's in that location where the depot once was. The uh, wood from the depot, uh, the depot actually stood till the 1960s. And then when it uh, was no longer used, it was sold and someone dismantled it and repurposed the wood to build a home in Auburn Hills, which still exists yet to this day. It looks nothing like the depot, but it uh, still was repurposed and exists in some sense. By 1919, uh, the downtown was renamed Auburn Heights. As I said, the name Amy wasn't particularly well liked. They wanted to go back to the name Auburn. So Auburn Heights was chosen as the name and that name still persists to this day. Many residents still call it the Heights. On the uh, left is a picture of the downtown at that time period. Uh, Auburn Road, as you see, is a dirt road. This is actually looking east down Auburn Road the White House that uh, would be closest to the center of the screen, that was the Suppus home. And eventually a storefront was added to that and they sold shoes out of that uh, building. Uh, a little further down the road, you see a building with a bell tower. That is our 1874 church, um, still on Auburn Road at that time. Uh, other residents in the area built homes, of course. Here's a home from that time period, the John Norris house. Uh, on the left is the house or circa 1900, and there's John Norris and his family standing on the front porch. That home still exists to this day. It's on Auburn Road near the entrance to College Heights Trailer Park. It is being used as a business called Benefit Advantage. I believe they sell insurance products to other businesses. Across the street from this home is a funeral home. And I bring that up because it has been a funeral home in this location for quite some time. The upper left picture shows it as Pixley Funeral Home, which is what stands there today. Prior to that in the lower right is what used to be there. And it was Dudley Moore Funeral Home. And before that, Harold Davis Funeral Home but it originally started as a farmhouse and all the neighborhoods that sit behind this uh, farmhouse were farmland for this home at that time. But eventually that farmland was sold off and neighborhoods were created. Uh, next door to that is this little ice cream shack in the upper left hand corner. Uh, it is called Twist and Dip today. It's operated under a few different names. That little building started life as a Gulf gas station. And prior to that Gulf gas station being built on that same corner once stood the Texaco station uh, shown down below. So if anyone talks about the gas station near the railroad tracks, this is that station. A bit further down the road at the corner of Squirrel, North Squirrel and Auburn Road is uh, this building shown in the upper picture. On that same location in the past were the two structures shown below. There was the Shorts Homestead and Horsey General Store. I've heard many people talk about when they were kids going to Horsey Store to buy candy. So it has been around for quite some time in this community. Uh, across the street from this structure is another large building that originally on that property was a 
a park, a public square, it was called. And the lower picture shows that public square. I, our first fire department was established there. That is the center structure that's um, sort of brown brick in color. And that eventually was replaced by a new fire house across the street. Uh, to the left is our 1874 church again. And then to the right is a memorial or monument there. It is called the Moms Memorial, Mothers of Men in Service. It was well, put there to um, honor those people that served in World War II, the, the local residents, um, men and women that uh, fought in World War II. So that monument still exists to this day. You can still see it in the upper picture, slightly to the right of the large building though there is plans to replace this monument with a new one that will be put in the Aaron Webster Cemetery. Uh, so this structure may not exist too much longer in this area, but quite a few people in this um, community have fathers and um, brothers and so forth that had served in the war and uh, are memorialized on this monument. A little bit to the west is the Shear Block. It was built in 1928, still stands today. It's many little businesses in there. Uh, the lower picture shows the same building at an earlier time during the 1950s. And uh, this kind of shows that our downtown wasn't always large buildings as it's starting to become now. Mostly it was small shops. There were no large Walmarts or Myers to shop at at that time. Across the street from it was the Mildebrandt block built in 1927. Um, it is today a uh, university center, it's called. It's a satellite training center for colleges or high school or something to hold classes there or to hold um, uh, tests in this location if they need to. It can be borrowed or rented from the city of Auburn Hills who owns this building today. Uh, prior to that, uh, Stan's dugout, a bar, uh, occupied that space. But in its earlier um, intent, the lower photo shows it um, as a plasty grocery store and there's a hardware store on the lower level and there's a doctor's office upstairs. I've heard certainly many residents talk about going to the doctor above the hardware store and this is where that would have taken place. Uh, there are a couple other small shops uh, that were on uh, South Scroll Road. These have both been torn down in recent years, but it helps uh, signify that this area was a, a low key community for quite some time. Uh, you would run down to the local shop to buy your bread and your milk. Uh, you wouldn't be going to Walmart or Myers to do that. On the corner of uh, Squirrel Court and Auburn Road is this fairly large restaurant today. I believe it's called Demetra's Opa at this point. It's gone under many names, Parkside, uh, Elwell's Grill, Bistro Bardot. Uh, this location has been a restaurant for quite some time. It actually started life as a little diner car and then as Stewart's Diner and then eventually it was added on to, as you see the little log structure in the upper picture uh, added to the diner car. And then um, the diner car went away and more structure was built. And eventually we had Patrick's and then it was renamed Shalea Inn. Um, this is actually how I remember it when I first moved to the community. It looked much like the lower right hand picture. Another uh, restaurant of Note is a country kitchen. Many people in the area remember it. It was torn down a few years ago. A, a park is going to be established on this location uh, because there, the Clinton River runs behind uh, this uh, location. And that was the doom of the restaurant because the Clinton River has a tendency to occasionally overrun its banks. It flooded the kitchen one too many times, making it unsanitary, and it just simply couldn't reopen any longer. So it, the country kitchen actually began life as the tomahawk, uh, which you see in the lower left-hand corner. 
And uh, next to the tomahawk, to the left of it, was lunch. Oops, was uh, Chuck's lunch shack. Um, it uh, was a place where you could get sandwiches and liquor. But these were both on the corner of Updike and Auburn Road, where the park will be soon. Another place that many local residents remember is Auburn Heights School. This was built in the 1920s and it's been a fixture in this community for a very long time. However, it was torn down a few years ago. Uh, today, there is an open field, as you see in the lower picture, there on the corner of Squirrel Road and Waukegan Street. That's where that school once stood. And uh, many residents went to that school uh, growing up. Eventually, it was replaced by Avondale High School, which is down at the end of Waukegan Street. And this is an earlier picture of it. It's been, of course, added on to since this time. So why did uh, Pontiac Township uh, decide that they wanted to um, become Auburn Hills? And that is because of annexation. Originally, Pontiac Township was, as you see in the map to the right, 36 square miles of land. On the lower left is Pontiac, the city, and it's outlined, you can sort of see through the green shading, a red line, that was the city of Pontiac. Everything else was Pontiac Township. However, as Pontiac City grew, it annexed land away from the township. It, uh, so you see the green border is what Pontiac is today, uh, the city, and it kept eating away at the township and the people in the township didn't want to pay the city taxes and they didn't want their land to be absorbed by the city. So they attempt to incorporate in 1971. By 1978, they become a charter township. And then by 1983, uh, Pontiac Township and of course the downtown area, which is part of Pontiac Township, Auburn Heights, it becomes Auburn Hills at that point. So I certainly can't cover everything uh, his, of historic value in the presentation, but um, this is some recommended reading that I suggest is the Red Book, um, Pontiac Township, 1827 to 1983. Uh, both of these books are about 100 pages each. The Pontiac Township book takes you from the earliest history up to 1983 when the city of Auburn Hills began and the Blue Book uh, city of Auburn Hills, a city is born, that pretty much takes you from the creation of Auburn Hills on to more recent times. Both of these books should be available in the Auburn Hills Public Library to check out. And um, if you cannot obtain them that way, feel free to contact the Historical Society. Um, I'll be glad to direct you to um, sources from which you can buy the purchase the books from. Uh, we have a Facebook page, you're welcome to check us out. And we do have public meetings the first Monday of every month at 7 p.m. We will not have one in December because of the holidays, but we will reconvene in January, assuming uh, COVID doesn't uh, stop some of those meetings. So feel free to check uh, with the Historical Society before attempting to attend. Are there any questions that anyone has uh, for me at this point? If you have questions, you can feel free to uh, type them in the chat, or if you wanted to jump in, you can unmute yourself. Um, but I had one to start. I was wondering, um, I know you, you work, you have a small archives for the um, Auburn Hills Historical Society. And what, I guess, information gaps do you guys have? Uh, what do you feel we could use a lot more information on? Um, it's the northern section of Auburn Hills, uh, we do not have a great deal of information about those areas. Uh, as I mentioned, the Bald Mountain area, the, um, the Canadian section, as we call it, uh, up where Great Lakes Crossing is. Um, not a lot of information has been recorded about those areas. So those are probably the largest information gaps that I would say we have. Thank you. Go 
great job too. I had no idea about some of that information. I don't know how it slipped past me, but um, Blue Sky Cinema was interesting too, because I know they just opened up a Blue Sky Brewery downtown. Ah, um, yes. I'm, I'm thinking that's probably a nod to that. It might be, I don't know. But yeah, many people in the area talk about going to the drive-in theater, Blue Sky. And uh, so that's why I wanted to uh, bring that up during the presentation so that people knew where it was because local residents may bring it up during oral history interviews. Yeah, and I know there's a couple of people on here who might not be familiar with the oral history project. Um, if you guys wanna be involved at all, feel free to let me know. I think everyone should have my email now. Um, it's just phelpsv at ahplibrary.org. Um, and I'd be happy to give you some more information about that project. I apologize, so I apologize if I missed anything at the very start. Uh, my computer was updating at an inopportune moment, uh, but um, uh, do you have a sense for the um, population of you know the township and then what became Auburn Hills o over time? Do you have some sense of how big it was at any point in the past and, and how it grew population-wise? I, I don't have exact figures of, as to how many people, uh, but what I didn't cover in the presentation because it gets into a lot of uh, deep history that um, isn't probably part of this project, but uh, Auburn itself started to grow quite significantly for a while. It, in fact, rivaled Pontiac as a, uh, a center hub for some time. Uh, when the railroad was planning to uh, build a line, uh, Auburn was uh, vying for that as much as Pontiac was. So uh, had that railroad run through Auburn instead first, um, we may have been the city hub rather than Pontiac at the time. Uh, so it, Auburn and Pontiac were growing pretty close to at the same rate early on in the 1820s. But then, uh, as I said, Pontiac started to get a little bit bigger. The, once the railroad ran through there, that was uh, pretty much the death knell for Auburn. Uh, most of the people that wanted to conduct commerce and move goods through uh, went to Pontiac and Auburn kind of shrunk at that point and uh, the population moved away. And it took quite a while for it to recover and not actually until a rail line was run through in the 1880s did uh, Auburn kind of recover in, in population and things started to grow again. Uh, that has something to do with why uh, I had to be renamed Amy at that point, because at some point Auburn got so small, it even lost its post office. It had no uh, mailing address. And in the meantime, in Auburn was established in Saginaw. And um, so when it, the community started to grow again and the post, post office was necessary, it had to uh, adopt a different name. But unfortunately, I don't have figures as to the exact population during those time periods. Can I add something? Go ahead. Woodward Avenue oh. had a lot of lot to do with the difference between Auburn and, and uh, Pontiac. Uh, the, it was the main road. And, uh, you know, that was nice for um, Auburn Hills, uh, Auburn, to have the uh, mills, but uh, up the line there was Pontiac Mills, and uh, again, that the, the Woodward Avenue really was before the railroads. The reason why the population dropped so fast. Hmm. I too it. Okay, if we don't have any other questions, I have some information I'm going to share in the chat. Um, if you have something else, feel free to again drop it in chat or um, go ahead and unmute. Um, but I'm gonna share, this is the Auburn Hills Historical Society page I just sent over in the chat and they have a timeline there as well, which is really helpful resource. Um, and then um, like Tyson mentioned, we have um, the 
Pontiac Township and the Auburn uh, Hills history books available at our library. So I can link those catalog items in our chat as well. Um, our library is um, back to doing curbside. Uh, tomorrow our building is scheduled to reopen. And so if you wanted to come in and browse, you can feel free to do that or you can schedule to um, pick up any of those materials uh, through curbside pickup. So I'm putting the, um, thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, the, I'm putting the um, catalog item. I just put in the Pontiac Township um, history book, which I've read. It's uh, got a whole lot of information about the founding of the community in there. Um, that runs from 1827 to eight, 1983. And then the uh, Auburn Hills, a city is born. Um, that URL. Okay, I put that in the chat there too. So uh, again, thank you everyone for coming and um, I will send out the uh, YouTube link once we have this online if you'd like to refer back to it or share it with some friends. Thank you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah it's good. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Mm -hmm. All right, so with that, I'm gonna close out and I hope you all have a great evening. Hopefully we'll see you in the library or curbside or something soon. Okay. Um, okay, we you. are going to have, for oral history committee members, we are gonna have a meeting next Tuesday as well. Um, I'll send out some more information about that now, uh, tomorrow, hopefully. <laughs> okay. Very good. Thanks, Thanks. Tyson. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Good night.